Hi, my name is Daniel Connell. Um, I've been running a project developing things that you can make yourself from recycled materials, which using basic tools with the idea that they be makeable by anyone anywhere under any circumstances. Wind turbines, hydro turbines, cook stoves, just basic, basic human needs kind of stuff. Uh, and then documenting it, doing full construction tutorials on how to make it and use it and replicate it. It's all open source, so welcome any feedback. Um, Especially if you do end up making this, uh, please let us know. We've got links to the Facebook group and my email in the description. Please post photos and all that sort of stuff. Today we're going to be making one of these, which is a rocket stove optimized for cooking. Um, it's just made of food cans and some insulation. We use, in this case, perlite, uh, a little bit of twisting wire, and that's it. All the materials involved here are about $2.00. Basically, you just got food cans, three large, two medium, three small. These don't have to be like specifically this exact size, like as long as they're generally about right. And then the other materials are twisting wire, perlite. This is the only stuff that you're likely to end up paying for, but it's real cheap. It's about $2 worth here. If you can't get this for some reason, I've also used pumice, which works really well. Uh, it's just like the small grain stuff. Vermiculite, which is similar to this. The tools we'll be using are pretty basic. Just a pair of tin snips, just scissors for metal. A pair of pliers. Snub nose is better than needle nose for when we'll be using these to twist wire. A stick for poking. A pen, magic, uh, like a permanent marker for drawing lines. And a can opener for opening the cans. I prefer this kind, like the jaggy tooth kind. It's better for a process which I'll explain when we get to that bit. So in terms of safety it's quite easy to cut your hands on bit of sharp, bits of sharp metal so if you're worried about that wear some kind of work gloves and other than that it's pretty safe. We'll be going through like fire safety and all that sort of stuff how to use the stove itself at the uh, later in the tutorial. Uh, other than that it's yeah it's not too dangerous a process. You will probably live First, take one of your medium cans, take the paper off, and then we're going to be just like opening this three quarters of the way around, so not taking the full thing out. So that you have like a flap, like that. And then you want to draw a line which basically starts from one end, comes around to the other end, and you want that to come out by about 30 degrees, it just eyeball that, like it doesn't need to be precise. Push that out of the way a little bit and you want to cut lines at about like a quarter of a way around between the rim and that line you just drew. Fold that bottom one in. Being really, this is kind of the point where like you want to start thinking about not cutting your hands so just be careful like take everything slowly don't rush and then probably using your pliers just to really crimp that metal bend those corner flaps down so that they lock so then take one of your large cans and you're just going to trace an oval on that which this is then going to poke out through at, a, at its 30 degree angle and then just mark the center and then draw so half that and then quarter it and then third those quarters so you end up with 12 segments and then you can use a drill for this next bit but you can also just use your can opener just punch a hole in the center there fairly roughly, large enough that you can then get your tin snips and cut out those sections. This doesn't need to be precise, I mean very little of this needs to be precise, really. This can be a bit fiddly for the first couple of cuts. If the metal just goes sideways on you rather than cutting then just sort of try to bend it back flat so you can get like a proper slice into it. And again, be real careful with your hands here because if you're going to cut yourself, this is when you're going to do it. 
so that you end up with that, which is super rough, but that's fine. Doesn't need to not be. And then just bend these tabs out. So just reach in with your pliers to the base of the triangle and and then just check that that goes through there basically at the 30 degree angle that it's going to be on. We're now going to do basically the same except in here to accommodate one of your small cans which will also be on that same 30 degree angle. So take one of your small cans remove the top and the bottom. This is the bit that's going to be facing like downwards and your chimney is going to be on the top. So draw an oval in that part of the face there. And this, this bit just sort of eyeball it and then kind of just eyeball. So using the same width but just make it longer so it's in an oval. And if it turns out too small, you can just cut it larger. And if it turns out too large, we'll be wiring it back shut. So, and then do the same thing of marking 12 sections and then punching a hole and then cutting it out in the same way. So, make sure that that goes nicely in there. And then we're just going to put a loop of wire around there and then twist that off. So the trick of twisting wire is to sort of grab as far down as you can with your pliers on the twist. You don't want to keep twisting from the top or you're basically like if you're like using the wire to twist itself if that makes sense then you're basically going to break it. Um, you want to always be getting down to the base of things. So something like that essentially and then just to stop that from wandering off I usually just bend a few of these tabs down. So that's the back half of the burn tube and the first sort of third of the riser. So your wood's going to be in here, your secondary combustion's going to be in here. We're going to just like make the other half of the burn tube. So take your can opener, you want to cut around two thirds and then leave about a centimetre each side of like connected metal and then cut out the rest. So you have two cuts, a large cut and a small cut. And then it's going to reach through carefully and bend that top flap out and down and that basically is now like a little shelf for sitting your wood in, gives you a little bit of extra length that it's going to like be held up, gives you like a little raised li lip which kind of like grabs onto the wood so it can't slide out as easily and lifts the wood up off the bottom of the tube so it can be surrounded by flame and air and burn a lot more effectively and this cut is to feed oxygen feed air into the coals which are going to collect in the bottom of the tube. Now to connect this into here in a sort of strong nice way, this is going to be on, on the, the bottom, on that bottom side, just make a little one centimeter or so, like really not very, not very deep cut and then just crush that in with some force and then just compiling all of these together, take your inner bit here, chuck that so that it's poking out through the hole there. Taking this bit here and then just forcing that into there very carefully because if you slip you're going to touch the metal. This can take a little bit of force. Like that. And then twist this front can so that your shelf is horizontal. So you can see this is starting to take shape. Now you've got the burn tube where your wood's going to go here and this is going to be your, your chimney sort of with the double wall. So we're just going to top and bottom your remaining two small cans and your large cans and then we'll just be, then we'll just be stacking those together. So you've got 
those two and then just going to be snipping these again like little snips on the edge to lock those together. So just keeping in mind that you want, if you've got like an inward facing sort of like end of a can, that's going to be your outer. Whereas if you've got like the bits that are sort of like pokey outy, they can be either inners or outers. It doesn't really matter. And then without dislodging things too much, just jam that in there. And so there's the chimney. It's not so vitally important that these connection points be super strong because this is going to be like surrounded and like packed in, in your insulation anyway. It is important that the, the connection between the two burn tube, like medium cans, is strong. And when these ones go on, these ones go on here, um, you want this to be strong downwards because if you've got like a pot of water or something heavy on there, you want that like downward force to be, to be quite strong. And then so we're just going to do similar uh, with your large cans. So cut off the top and bottom. Then on either side of these, you want to just make four really little cuts, just like a centimeter, evenly spaced. And then you're going to have basically two tabs that go outside. So you just want to bend those out a little bit and two that go inside. So like two opposite ones sort of go out a bit, the other two go in a bit. And then you're just going to drop that over here. That, essentially. And then the same with this one. And I actually don't really love this connection method. It's good and strong for downwards force, but it's a bit sort of gappy and like you can get like perlite spilling out of there. Because the outer wall shouldn't really get that hot because like you've got so much insulation in between, you can put some tape, like some gaffer tape or something around there just to seal it in, but it, it seems a bit inelegant. So if anybody has a better idea of how to do this, then let me know. There's, this is all a open source project, um, like everything that I design. So like you can hit me up in the comments or send me an email. Uh, my email address is in the link in the description. Uh, also we have like a Facebook group which is like the discussion forum for all this and you can ask questions there but also like please post results. Like if you do make this please let us know. And so then that's quite strong downwards but not necessarily strong upwards. So if you pick this up especially when it's like got the insulin in there and is full weight that can then separate out which is sort of why I don't love this connection method but it is sort of good and strong that way especially when this is fully packed. So just a loop of twisting wire or some kind of fencing wire or whatever you're using around the base there just to lock it off and then just make sure that that's your chimney centered. One of the last steps we're going to do is we're just going to basically fill this with perlite. It can be handy to use like one of the lids that you cut off here just as a sort of like shield so that you don't end up pouring perlite into your chimney there. So just make sure that everything's sort of like basically closed off. There's not any huge gaps that it's going to like piss out into. Like it's quite fine grain stuff. So it can find its way into your burn tube here. And if it's like the occasional bit here and there, like that's fine. But if you've got like a serious hole, then it's just going to like pour in there. So that's what the twisting wire was for basically. And so that's just a matter of pouring that in there. Get things keep nice and centered and then taking your stick, just making that nice and compact. So you just want to fill that up pretty much to the level of the inner tube so that you end up with that kind of situation. So on this one, like the, the tube is, like the burn tube is not really kept, it's 30 degrees, like it's sort of, I'll sort of let that sort of get a little bit flat, but it'll still do the job. Just remains to make four cuts, evenly spaced, and then just bending out from those lines, triangles. So bending like, sort of just bending the, the corners in, essentially. Uh, and that's to give like a gap for the fire to get out. And so if you've got like a pot on here, like 
that's like uh, space for the flame to get out. Otherwise, it'll it won't draw, it won't f won't flow. But it also makes these points just stronger. Because um, if you just like cut down and sort of bent a tab in or whatever, like these would be quite floppy. But having those corners sort of like bent over makes them a lot more stable, so that they'll take like heavier heavier loads. And then one last step, just to sort of make the thing a bit sort of safer and nicer. These, um, these tabs here, uh, just sort of give them, just like bend them back on themselves, basically. Let's curl them. And that's basically it. It's important when you light this the first time that you do so in a ventilated area because there's sort of plastics and metals in here which will burn off with that first burn when it gets up to full temperature. And then after that, they won't be present anymore. But just that first time, just give it like, you know, five, ten minutes, like, in an empty space. Don't breathe it, basically. And uh, after that, it should be good for, for indoor, indoor use, if necessary. So this is about the size of wood that you want, about a centimetre or two square, and yay long, just enough that it can reach the back of the, uh, of the burn tube and be resting on the, on the shelf here. It's important that you have the wood in air as much as possible, which is the reason of this little shelf here, because then like, you get air all around it, you get fire all around it, you get coals underneath it, um, and it burns a lot more effectively. You don't want to overstock this, you don't want to overfeed it. You want to have about, like when it's running optimally and up to, up to temperature, you'll have like about a quarter full of coals, a quarter full of wood, and then half full of air. And that's about optimal. The more flame you can get from your wood, the more volume of flame, and if you can fill like your riser with fire, then it bumps up the temperature, you get a more complete burn, it's a lot more efficient, and it dumps all of the energy out of your, out of your fuel into what you're cooking like very, very quickly. And you'll have to keep, like, you know, keep an eye on it. It'll go out after like five or 10 minutes because it'll just burn through the fuel. But if you're cooking on it anyway, you're gonna be here. It's not like a sort of set and forget heating kind of stove, it's a cooking stove. So it's something that you're gonna have your eye on. So the limitations of the stove are mostly the materials that it's, um, that it's food tin, so it's thin, mild steel. So this won't last forever. This isn't meant to be, la to, this isn't meant to last forever. This isn't something you'd build into your house and like, you know, have for, for decades and pass on to your children. This is meant to be rapidly makeable, rapidly deployable and do a good job. It's for low resource environments, global southern countries, um, disaster relief, refugee camps, camping, prepper situation, survivalist situation, homesteading, like anywhere that you need to be able to cook food, cook, um, heat water very quickly and easily with like basically nothing in materials. This is a very cheap, easy and effective design. So lighting it is just a process of putting some, some paper, some kindling in the bottom of the tube. Not too much, just enough to hold a flame. A couple of little wood chips, some surface area, and then a couple of long bits, especially if you've got something which is a bit sort of feathered, just to take that initial flame. And I find the easiest way is just to light it in the, uh, the oxygen gap. Once it's going, you'll know because it'll stop smoking. Wood will start burning away into coals. Once you get the coals in the bottom of your tube, then anything you put in there is just going to burst into flame, essentially. So that's that. That's how you make it. That's how you use it. Like I say, if you make one of your own, uh, please let us know. Post in the comments from the Facebook group. I uh, just wanted to uh, add that this uses about 80% less firewood than equivalent open fire. So in a lot of parts of the world, that means people have to spend less time gathering firewood, less deforestation, less soil erosion, and less, um, less smoke means less smoke inhalation, less respiratory disease, which kills more people per year than malaria. Um, and it's lightweight, it's portable, it's easy, it's safe and it's good. So yeah, that's it. Thanks for, thanks for watching. Like and subscribe, etc.